Okay. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for another day, Lord, that we can come together in your house. And we ask you that you would minister this morning in this Sunday school class, that Sister Cindy anoint her, Lord, anoint each one of us to hear the words, Lord God, and understand what the Word of God is saying. Bless and touch and meet to me. Amen. But like we've gone through these uh, Greek words a whole lot, but uh, Mr. Chris, do you want to read our scripture at the beginning and then we'll kind of skip over all, a lot of the words? Read, you want me to read the uh, Jude 5 through 7? Yes, sir. I will therefore put you in remembrance. So, Though you once knew this, have as the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, <clears throat> afterward destroyed them that believed not. And the angels which <clears throat> kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains <clears throat> under darkness, under darkness, under the judgment of that great day. <clears throat> Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication, going out of strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal life. Amen. And we have all of these Greek words that we've gone over and gone over several times. But we have all of this written down here, which is the words for angels kept not, but left own habitation, reserved everlasting chains under darkness unto judgment. Kind of runs together, yeah. Oh, I'm just going through the names, not uh, all the meanings, because I think we've had. Page um, 16, where she went. No, I'm on 17 now. Hey. Yeah, I'm mean, just going over this because we've done so many of these words that it's not funny. And uh, and it does take quite a long time to go through each and every one. But the great day, and in like manner, giving themselves over to fortification, uh, going after strange flesh, set forth, almost reads like the scripture. Example, suffering, and eternal fire. And that's page 18. Now the synopsis on all of those words, the book of Jude was written by Jude, the half-brother of Jesus, that natural born brother of James, the writer of the book of James, who became the leader of the church in Jerusalem. Initially, Jude was ecstatic and bursting with excitement to write to God's people and discuss the many shared blessings of salvation. However, after reading Peter's second letter, Jude became deeply disturbed over the infiltration of false teachers and false prophets into the church and decided to shift his focus urgently motivating his readers to earnestly contend for the faith, to strengthen the vitality and the magnitude of his message, Jude took the time to remind his readers of the example of the scripture where God's judgment came upon those who deviated from the truth and living in rebellion against him. In Jude 5, he tells his readers, I will therefore put you in remembrance, though ye once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved his people out of the land of Egypt, afterwards destroyed them, and that believe not. Taking into account the original Greek meaning of the key words of this passage, here is a Renner interpretive version. I counsel you to remember several things that I'm about to remind you of, even though all of this was once fully known to you in the past. First, you must never forget how the Lord 
having delivered and preserved and saved his people from their Egyptian enemies, protected, restored, and brought them back into wholeness at a time he brought them out of the land of Egypt. But after all God had done for them, they perpetually did not trust him. He was so put off by their unbelief that he eventually decided to distance himself from them and to finally bring an end to the unbelieving generation after all God had done for them, they remained unconvinced, unpersuaded, and faithless. This is the first in a series of biblical examples that Jude proves, provides, excuse me, provides to warn believers of all generations that no one is exempt from God's judgment. If we try, if we add to or take away from or twist his words, we will be judged accordingly. And there's a definite warning. Take the word as it is. Yeah, don't try to put, don't put your take on it. I mean, bringing it down to the regular, what, and agree to the English, that's one thing. But putting your own twist on it and making it say what you want it to say is not smart. That's an, uh, that's an attitude of the final word of God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's gotten a lot of people in trouble. <laughs> yes, well, yes. I don't mean to laugh at their calamity, but it, it's gotten a, a lot of people in trouble. The destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities of the region are another example of God's judgment against sin. For the longest time, I did not know that God destroyed more than just Sodom and Gomorrah. There was five cities, five mm -hmm. and he destroyed all five of them, but only two are mentioned, which means they must have been the worst two. The leaders. Probably. <laughs> very, very probable. There yeah. is a, um, if anyone's interested, there is a, a fairly recent, maybe in the last five years, excavation down at the south end of the Dead Sea where they have, I think, Tel Amman, uh, very, very likely is the original Sodom or the Oregon War. I can't remember wow. which. Uh, all of the circumstances fit precisely with the account of Scripture. And they've got pictures of it that shows where they've excavated. Everything is blown away down to the foundation, this foundation block, it's all it's there. Everything is, uh, there's beads of stuff that's been melted, like porcelain, oh, wow. stuff that's just been so hot. Yeah. It's pretty interesting. Well, you think about that, um, when the Lord talks about hell's fire, mm -hmm. and you know, we, we do not have a real adequate interpretation because if people had an adequate interpretation of hell's fire means mm -hmm. they would be running to the nearest church to get saved get things right and live a decent life um, you know and I don't think it's preached on enough you know we, we, we need to do something to be able to reach others but not scare them to death but you know reach them. but that's that's part of it you, you know, there's got to be a balance. If we scare people to come to church, once they're not scared anymore, what are they going to do? That's it. You know, they haven't really made a heart commitment. It's just, dang, i got to do something. Yeah. You know, I mean, there's a lot in that. There, there is a huge amount. But if that's where you get when being led by the Spirit. Right. You know, right. and uh, He tells you, say this, and you have something else come to mind, uh-uh, don't do that, do this. And we've got to learn to be faithful and listening and doing what we're told. Because what you're told may be the difference between somebody going to heaven and somebody busting hell wide open. Which I think is pretty huge when it comes down to the brass tacks of it all. Anyway. Jude's second example of the retribution of those who revolted against God's commands involved angels. He said, 
and the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved an everlasting change unto darkness, under darkness, excuse me, unto the day of the judgment of the great day. As we saw in lesson one, we when we read this verse in the original Greek, it is meaning comes alive. For example, the word angels is a Greek word angelos, which is plural in its form and describes angels. In the case the angels Jude wrote about are either those who rebelled with Lucifer against the authority of God or the disobedient angels who abandoned their God-assigned habitation to enter into Earth's atmosphere and cohabit with women and produce monstrous giants in the Earth, which we read about in Genesis 6, 1 through 4. Um, my question is, is that where Goliath come from and his four brothers? My question is, is that where Goliath come from and his four brothers? From the angel's habitation with women? It, it's, I, I think weird, okay? <laughs> There's not much I can do about it. But uh, it, it just makes you wonder because there, there's giants in the land. And I do know in the Smithsonian, I forget which one of the Smithsonians, but downstairs in the Smithsonian, they have a human uh, skeleton. And the human skeleton stands 11 foot 6. So, uh, you know, that's... that's that is tall. I mean, <laughs> I saw a thing online a while well back of a skeleton they found, and the skull was as big as a car. It was huge. And a human skull? Yeah. Well, maybe that was the monstrous giants. We, you know. It's hard to know. It is hard to know to go back and be able to decipher all the past and to learn it all, but it gives you food for thought. I think it, uh, I don't remember the reference, if it's in Jude or elsewhere, but it uh, talks about uh, these are, the fact it's probably here in Jude, these are the uh, giants but, uh, of old, uh, heroes of old or something like that. And uh, if you stop and think about the <coughs> Uh, Greek, Roman, Scandinavian myths of, you know, the larger than life people, Hercules, or just different ones, that might play into this as well. True. Yeah, because they did have um, myths, but a lot of myths come out of facts. Somebody's qualifying? <laughs> it's okay. Uh, it happens to everybody. Anyway. Anyway, Jude, Jude said these angels kept not their first estate. These words kept not are a form of Greek word tarot, which normally depicts soldiers who are positioned to protect something that is important. These were soldiers who were charged to charged and expected to be faithful to their charge given to them and stand guard over what they have been entrusted to them. In this verse, the phase kept not describes a group of angels who were given an assignment by God but failed to keep in the trust that was assigned to them. So that tells you that angels are free will. Mm -hmm. They can choose to do what is right, what God tells them or they can choose not to, just like us. We can choose to do what the Lord says, that's or we can walk that's away. That's where Satan's came to. They came from heaven. They left with it. I know, but he, 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 he was probably the most beautiful, most powerful angel in right. heaven. And he stand, stood over what God's room and uh, protected it. And then he got to the point where he thought he was better than God, and he could ascend above God and rule everything. That's a sin. Yeah. Well, and pride gets to you when 
you have, um, you know, he had the in musical ability. That's where you get some of these demonic, uh, these bands that uh, they drive people to do stuff the music does. Uh, that's because of the enemy. He's he's got that his fingers in that music, and it it can actually push people away from God. There's no, there, he's not trying to make you fall. If he can, he'll make you fall. There's a spirit in music. There is a spirit in music. It'll either be something that lifts God up and praises his name, or it'll be something that tears you down and you don't even know what's happening. And some of it is, is so demonic that it will really drive people to do things that the normal person wouldn't do. Yeah. Um, I listened to a story the other day about Anton LaVey's one daughter. She got away from all of this, but he had, and she mentioned the fact, he, I mean, he's dead now, but he had sacrificed his younger daughter to the devil. Oh, my God. Well, he was going to do that with her, too. And uh, that was his... Which means to do that and not get in trouble by the law, they had those babies at home. Mm -hmm. So they weren't, no, no records. So, uh, yeah, that was one wicked soul. And we also had, uh, he wrote a so-called, quote-unquote, Bible for the satanic. What was it? Anton Lillard. I know that because my brother Jens fought me when I first got saved, uh, he would come at me with that Anton Lay, and I would stand there and tell him, no, and I will not move, I will not bow. And uh, it took him a while, but then he got away from it, and then finally a couple years before he died, he started letting me talk to him about God. Hey. Yeah, so. I found a skeleton. Oh, you did? Wow. She found a skeleton. <laughs> In the closet? <laughs> On the phone. <laughs> That's a giant. Let's see. Wow. Whoa. I can't see it from there. But I'll, okay. I'll show you. you. You'll get to me eventually. <laughs> <laughs> That's where my head went. <laughs> now we know what the problem is. <laughs> you really got to put that oh, in, did you? Thank you for clearing that up for me. <laughs> wow. With that man standing there yeah. and showing the size of all of that, uh, boy, that's the that perspective. The head is about the size of that man. Yeah, but that from his... Uh, Top of his, head, his, his folded arms is about the size of that that man. Wow. You don't have men, men that, you don't have people that size anymore. Well, said there was giants in the land in those wow. days. There's a giant. Nephilim. Nephilim, yes. And you wonder if Adam and Eve were giants. Well, I figured Adam stood 12 foot tall, and I figured Eve's probably where she could fit under his arm about 11 yeah. foot six. Yeah. Uh, because they were in absolute perfection. I mean, Adam and Eve must have been absolutely gorgeous and dazzling in their looks, but they had something on them which would... <laughs> oh, shoot! <laughs> uh, the sound guy is pointing to himself. <laughs> anyway, uh, they had the one thing that uh, we don't have anymore. They had the glory of God wrapping them and covering them. All you could see probably was their face. I mean, they were awesome creatures. I mean, seriously. Yeah, I mean, we still got the sound guy pointing like this to himself. Maybe he needs prayer. He might. He might. Uh, Lord help us. <laughs> anyway, Jude tells us 
They kept not their first estate, but after their own habitation, but left their own habitation. I got to calm down a little bit here. The word, but here is the Greek word ala, which is used to as conjunction to jar or jolt the reader or to really listen to what is about to be said. Jude was. <coughs> Jude then continued by saying these angels left their own habitation. The word left is a translation of the Greek word. I can't do that one. Thank you. Which is a compound of apo and lepo. And the word apo means away from. And the word lepo means abandon, to leave, to forsake, to vacate. When these words are joined to form, okay, Apollo, okay, kind of got it. It means to abandon, to desert, to forsake, to leave, to walk away from, to totally forsake, or to vacate by leaving a post. So they forsook God. Yeah, for whatever their reason was, which I can't see. If, something that's an angel of light living in the absolute beautiful glorious light of God the choose darkness, that's the choose darkness. Yeah. the angels you <laughs> referred to had abandoned their God ordained post as well as their own habitation this phrase is translated of the Greek words okay which describes their own assigned dominion or principalities instead of being faithful to their calling and guarding what had been assigned to them. These angels abandoned their posts. Consequently, Jude said, God hath reserved in everlasting change unto, under darkness unto the judgment of the great day, Jude 6. We learned that the word reserved is a form of the Greek word tarot which was used to depict an, the uninterrupted vigilance of soldiers positioned protecting something. Jude used this word to depict Christ as one who attentively stands guard over this class of rebellious angels. Although these angels failed to maintain their positions, Jesus had <coughs> failed to maintain maintain his. Due to his watchful guarding of them, this particular fallen angels will never escape their place of detention. I can't imagine what goes through their brains. Like I gave it all up for this. You know? In fact, Jude said that they are in everlasting change in the Greek, the word everlasting is adeo, adios, I hope I got it right, which describes something eternal or everlasting. Thus, the sin of these angels was so severe that God has placed them in everlasting chains and everlasting detention. In this category of sinning, angels are still constrained at this very moment in unbreakable change. The, the Greek word for change here is desmos, and it describes heavy physical chains of iron that were used to hold captives as they languished in prison. This word could also be described as any implement that restricts one's ability to move. That's pretty. I never thought about the chains being so heavy they couldn't move. Yeah. Well, well, we think about what we know. Yeah. You know, we have little change. I mean, we have logging truck chains that are hard to drag around and stuff like that. But, uh, huh? It's probably worse than that. Uh, the, the size of these chains seems how the power of these angels that they were given must be horrendous. Yeah, I knew just that. Why did change? But, you know, I never thought about Jesus being the one watching over these guys. Here we see that God has personally uh, chosen, 
chained this category of rebellious angels, the shackles he placed on them in an unbreakable bonds or unbreakable change. Thus, when God created, when God in, uh, in thank you. I got my brain's going too fast this morning. Too many things. I got to calm down. It was a permanent, irreversible decision. Just imagine these immense celestial creatures of power are <coughs> eternally restricted in their movement. Where are these, where are these angels eternally chained? Jude said, under darkness. The word under is a Greek word, hupo, which denotes being under something, as if one is placed under a cloak or some type of some type. In this case, these sinning angels were placed under darkness so bleak that it is never penetrated by light, and from which there is no escape. In Greek, the word darkness, or zophos, which depicts dense blackness, unceasing, never-ending darkness, a place void of all light. Think about it. This would be the ultimate judgment upon angelic creatures who had been created to live in the light of God's glory. And now they have none of it. This imprisonment in these heavy chains under the blanket of bleak darkness to last under the judgment of the great day, the word unto is the Greek word es, which means unto and carries the idea of progression. By using the word es, God is telling us that the incarnation, incarceration, why am I messing that word up? I don't know. I said it in Greek last night when I read over this too. <laughs> but, uh, incarceration, he in, initiated with this category of sinning angels will continue until the judgment of the great day. We saw the word judgment in the Greek is Christus, and it describes a decision made by a legal court, a court degree, a legal procedure at court, or the verdict delivered that results in judgment. This word Christus is translated here as judgment, depicts a time in the future when the court of heaven will render a final judgment on these rebellious angels on the great day. They've been stuck there for a long time. No, they're not. And this has been thousands of years, you know. So, the phrase great day is translated in the Greek, and I can't say that one, Somebody might be able to, but I can't. Very good. He's got it. <laughs> I know my phone said that last night when I got over the top of these. Trying to learn. Which literally means the big day. The coming judgment day Jude describes has been foretold since the beginning of time. At the end of the age, that big day will finally arrive. And those who have lived in disobedience to God will not circumvent judgment, not even angels who rebelled against him. Taking into account the original Greek meaning of these terms, here is a Rick Renner interpreting version. Excuse me. Here's another example of something you should remember. I'm asking, I'm, 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 my, mind, I'm, my mind's about four sets too far ahead. No, I, I drank my decaf. I, I don't do caffeine, I can't. I love it, but I can't. Probably. <laughs> Calm myself down. I'm talking about the angels that did not stay at their post God had assigned to them. Instead of staying at their God-appointed post, they abandoned their own dwelling places and high-ranking dominions that had been assigned to them, but God has not abandoned his post and he is standing guard over those rebellious angels and has eternally put them in change under bleak darkness unto the big day of judgment in the future. 
that's pretty powerful when you really sit down and you think about it. <coughs> there is a never an escape, never plea bargaining your way out of it, never getting a lesser sentence. Um, they're stuck for not change, no way of changing God's no. mind. No. They, they did it to themselves. Yeah, when they have lived, goodness knows how long, in the glory of God, in His beautiful presence, in His holiness, and they had all that light and all that love. And uh, they, they just can't wrap around. They were on my brain that they had shown darkness over God. Well, actually, they didn't choose darkness over God. They chose to rule. Oh, and so darkness was a punishment. Yeah. That was what they chose. Yeah. I think they may have thought that they could whoop him and well, take it. Yeah, well, that was a third of them. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there was quite a few. Well, when you think about a third of the angels, and we have no idea how many that is. We have yeses and we have pots, but no actual idea like it's a billion or a hundred billion. We don't even know none of it. We, we just take these wild guesses and know we're wrong. <laughs> Underestimate the power of God. Yeah. Because he's been so loving, so good, so kind, so caring that they, they thought that they had the right to do what they did and they don't. Which is sad, but nonetheless. Well, what's also sad that it applies to us too is we can walk with the Lord and we know his glory and his presence and get what he does for us to take care of us. And then you see these guys turn around and go back in the opposite direction. You can wonder why when they've been with the Lord. Yeah, it, they know how he is. Yeah, me, when I messed up, I, I always condemn myself. Uh, I always looked at me like I was worthless, no good, useless, never achieve anything, never walk right. I mean, I just beat myself up till I was good and bloody. And uh, I know some people do that. But uh, I can't imagine doing that on purpose. No, my nephew. God for what people did to his little brother. His older brother. He's decided that there is no God because of what people did to his handicapped brother. It just doesn't make any sense to me. I don't know how that. It doesn't make sense. Yeah. It, it's just something else. I mean, I'm in the wrong section. I got lights on. Ain't nobody home today. God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah by fire. 
I don't know if you ever thought about it, but that's Jesus and two of his angels walking up to Abraham. You know, we, we don't think about it. We just think, like, the Lord came down. And, you know, and the only one time you usually see in, like, somebody who refers to God is it's actually Jesus, like Melchizedek. Like he's a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. I mean, seriously. And then you see him uh, showing up here and there. And that would explain why he's walking through the seven churches in Revelations. He's there. He's taking into account everything that's going on, everything that's being said. Jude reminds readers of this historical fact saying, even as Sodom and Gomorrah, the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire, Jude 7. Notice the phrase, in like manner. In Greek, this word literally means in a similar way, in like fashion, or in a similar turn of events. The reason Jude includes this phrase is because he is drawing a connection between the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah and the sin of the angels he talked about in verse 6. The fact that certain angels left their God-assigned post and went after mortal women and had sexual relations with them ex is extremely strange, yet that is what Genesis 6, 1 through 4 tells us happened. Jude said in a similar way or in a like fashion, the people of Sodom and Gomorrah were giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh. Jude 7. And the judgment they reaped was a similar turn of events. Interestingly, the phrase giving themselves over to fornication is a translation of the Greek word and that's one I can't do, and pastor's not here to do it for me, um, which is a compound of the words ek and pronu. Pro, pro, new. Uh, the preposition ek means after, and it's used in it inter... inter Thank you. I'm just stuttering all the way. The word perconus, perconos depicts unsanctioned sex outside of the confines of marriage. When these words are joined to form this word, it refers to the, the perverted sexual activities that were known in Sodom and Gomorrah. Specifically, it pictures those who gulped, gulped, how do I say, did I say that, gulped, G-L-U-T? Blood. Blood. Okay, got it. Themselves with forbidden sexual activities and who go whoring after illicit sexual behaviors. This brings us to the Jews' description going after strange flesh. In Greek, this word going is, um, it's another big one I can't do, I'm sorry. And it depicts a departing from one thing to another. The use of <coughs> tells us the people of Sodom and Gomorrah and surrounding cities had departed from what was natural to pursue strange flesh. Normally, this word going indicates forward movement. In this case, the people of Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, it meant that they were in moral retreat. How do we know they were moving backwards? It is confirmed clearly in the meaning of the word after, and the Greek word espos, which means behind, back, backward, and describes backward movement. Although the <coughs> people of the region viewed themselves as progressives, you see that in the news today? They were in backward movement and veered from God's original design that led them into a cesspool of moral de depravity. <coughs> Which is an 
all of them. Yes. I'm sorry. It's okay. It's okay. She always has cough drops. <laughs> it's kind of my thing, cough drops. She's smoking too much weed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just really don't think so. <laughs> okay. Specifically, you said that the sodomites and those of the surrounding cities were going after strange flesh. This translation of the Greek words septos, kirtos. The word sekos means flesh, as in human flesh, and the word kirtos means a completely different kind. Jude used these words to inform us rather than seek natural sexual relations with a member of the opposite sex, you know, male or female. The people of Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities went after or morally reverted backward into a different kind of sexual encounter, which was foreign and contrary to God's original plan. These perverted practices are what unleashed God's judgment on people. Jude declared that the consequences reaped by Sodom and Gomorrah and the people of the region are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. <clears throat> You know, we see it to where those, those five cities were wiped out, but it was more than they were just wiped out. They're in eternal fire now. And um, I don't know about you, but I remember reading it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Yeah, yeah. exactly. You know, you, you, you've got to walk the walk and talk the talk and keep your heart right. Yeah, you know, we all mess up. We're human. We mess up. But yes, God, forgive me, keep going. Right. It took me a long time to learn that because I used to just beat myself up to this little thing. I beat myself up to his bloody. <laughs> but yeah. But anyway. Okay. Now, did I get to the next section or? Okay. <coughs> Jude declared that the consequences of reaped by Sodom and Gomorrah and the people of the region are set forth as an example suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. In Greek, the phrase set forth is derived from the word pokemai, I'm not sure, which is a compound of the word po and kemai. And the word po is a preposition meaning in front. And the word <coughs> kemai means to appoint, to designate, or to set as to set something in place. Thus, God had appointed, designated, and set in front of us an example of Sodom and Gomorrah as a reminder of divine judgment. The word example here is a Greek word, digma, digma, you think that's it? I don't know either. Which means an example of or a pattern. This use of this word infamous to informs us, excuse me, us to what that God did to Sodom and Gomorrah is a divine pattern placed before us of what will happen to the ungodly in the future. They were experienced the su suffering and the vengeance of eternal fire, Jude 7. In the Greek, term for suffering is kupikero, uh, lupeko, I'm not sure. A word that means to be forcibly subjected to, to be forcibly held under, and to undergo. It pictures one who is held accountable and punished. The punishment reserved by God for such evildoers is eternal fire. This is a translation of the Greek words 
uh, I'm, I'm not real good at this. I keep trying and learn the words, but some of them I get, some of them not yet. It means fire and depicts flames swirling, whirling, flickering, twisting, turning, and arching upward towards the sky. And the word anos here pictures something that is everlasting. In this case, it depicts a consuming fire that will engulf one forever. Taking into account the original Greek meaning of these words, here is a Rick Renner interpretation. But wait, here's another example you need to remember. I am talking about what happened to with Sodom and Gomorrah, <coughs> or what happened to them and the surrounding cities all around them is similar to what happened to the angels that deserted their pre-designed part, part post that God had planned for them in like manner. The people of Sodom and Gomorrah left what was the natural and gave themselves over to fornication to follow after feelings and in, instincts, mannerism and urge that urges that were not natural, deviant, mutants, that, mutation, well, mutants, <laughs> that resulted in departing from natural behaviors. They were normally reverted backwards as they strangely engaged with those of their same sex. What happened to those people of those cities is placed before us as a clear pattern of what is coming in the future when the yeah. my eyes are missing out yeah. mount, mount in God's court of law will be dropped and the irreversible verdict will be issued as a result of the guilty being subjected to a fire that eternally engulfs them. In our, in our third lesson, we will continue examining Jude's letter and see how apostate believers, leaders and believers, ignorantly use the word to belittle and undermine those who are in authority. And we really need to probably pray. I need my eyes to get better. Eventually, I gotta have cataracts removed. Oh, that's bad. Yes, ma'am, that's the problem. <laughs> or God can heal them. Okay. God can heal your eyes. Well, we're gonna let the guy who's got the smart mouth in the back, if you'll please pray.